uh, is expert in, uh, in this subject, but in, in another, uh, another issues concerning communications and sensing, and you can read in, the, in his uh, CV that uh, you have in uh, your material. But uh, just, uh, just to say that uh, Professor Havel is a, is a principal research officer from the National Research Council of Canada. So he has a, a very important responsibilities in this, uh, in this council. And he is a fellow of Optical Society of, uh, of America and is uh, also fellow of the uh, European uh, Optical Society and, 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 and is fellow also in the Physics Institute, Institute of Physics uh, in UK. So uh, it's time to give the word to, to Professor Havel because uh, they are going to share with you a very interesting piece of knowledge that uh, I mentioned before is very complementary between uh, communications and between sensing. So, Professor Harvey, thanks for coming, for coming, and it's your time. Well, thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Professor Figuera, por esta muy amable introducción. So, I think the language should be English, right? <laughs> So if I ask you about what is the word you uh, was repeated many, more, uh, most than, more than any other word the uh, last few days, it's integration, right? So it's really key, uh, key word, right, in uh, and leitmotiv of uh, many talks we have, uh, we have heard. So silicon photonics, why we are really working on silicon photonics? Uh, well, uh, maybe a little bit simplified statement can be because we have silicon microelectronics. And can you think about any other material than silicon that brought such an incredible success in terms of how we can integrate different functionality on a single chip? Well, obviously, there is no other material in this than silicon, in, uh, in, uh, at least as we know it today. If you really look at the silicon success story, uh, in uh, 1957, the first silicon chip was invented by Fairchild Semiconductors. Then, a few year place, uh, years later, uh, Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, predicted that the capacity of chips, the number of transistors, counts of is going to be increasing every year by a factor of two, 100 percent. And this trend has really been there for last from 1970. That's impressive. So first Intel chip, 1968. 1,200 transistors. Where I was a student, they were talking about 10,000 transistors. We thought, this is really mind-blowing. This is so, so, so incredible. Today, we have 32 core AMD EPIC, 19 billion transistors. Right? So that's, that's really something astonishing. And uh, all these gadgets we are using today, all these basically are possible because of this, uh, this amazing development that I don't think has a parallel in the mankind uh, technological uh, development. So today, as you know, we live in the Zeta byte era, Zeta 10 to 21, right, 21st. At least 1,000 petabytes of data are generated every day. This is 50 times the size of US Library of Congress. So the question is obviously, and you listen talks from the super stars and leaders in the world, that, so I'm not going to be going to that, but just to remind you that how do we transmit and store all this information? So obviously for transmitting via optical fiber internet, today the internet capacity 2017, two, 195, nearly 300 terabit per second worldwide. Uh, these cables are installed not just obviously under sea, but in uh, data centers at 300 million kilometers per year in 2017, right? This is uh, just an astonishing number. We store in data centers mostly, right? So this is an example from Google and OR, the center 46,000 over 46,000 square meters, right? nearly a million of servers, and all these servers have to be talking to each other, so you need 20,000 kilometers typically, right? Facebook, Facebook alone, only, only in, the, in the Facebook data center. So obviously that fiber needs some transceiver, needs a transmitter on one side, receiver on the other side. Well, that's uh, one of the key products of a company Laxterra, like you already heard, uh, founded by Professor Eli Ablanovich. So, 
let's go now a little bit, take a few steps back and try to see what are the real foundations of the thing. So how, how we are going to actually, so how many people of you work in silicon photonics or integrated optics? Excellent. So for those that are not that familiar, just a little reminder. So we are all familiar with optical fibers. We have uh, uh, core of the fiber, typically about 10 micro in size. We dope it with some germanium, right, to raise the index compared to the surrounding, uh, very little, 0 0.01. But that's enough to maintain a confined single mode, right? In there, you can propagate it for hundreds of kilometers, right? And the band radius, you can bend this fiber with several millimeters, not more, because the light would just escape from the fiber because of this. Uh, small confinement, uh, model confinement, a small index contrast between the core and the cladding. So this build of glass, right? So you can use basically the same glass, right? Erbium doped or germanium doped, uh, germanium mostly, right? Uh, phosphorus to uh, on the chip, right? So you can use a, a thin film deposition techniques, uh, PCVD or something like that, and grow really these uh, different layers, and you can make optical wave guides on the chip. This is again integrated optics which originates from Bell Labs, right, in the late 60s, early 70s, the key contribution, people were thinking about uh, making integrated optical circuits, okay? And the glass was obviously uh, one of the first materials that, uh, that had been used. Again, the index contrast here would be 0 0.01, so that's, uh, you cannot bend it too tight, right? So you cannot make really complex circuits if you just to bend the waveguide, you need six millimeter of uh, wafer real estate. If you use silicon, though, it's a very different story. So comparing the size here, so basically now we are making uh, waveguides out of silicon. And uh, what is interesting is silicon, the index at 1.5 telecom wavelength is about 3.5. And if you use silica, the glass, as a, uh, as a cladding, then you have all of a sudden index contrast not 0 0.01, but 2, which is 200 times larger. So this allows you to really squeeze the mode comparing these two modes, so they are 500, 600 times smaller in cross-sections, and now you can bend these waveguides very tightly with a bend radius of a few micrometers, and the light will still stay in those waveguides. So this is an example of such typical waveguides. So you can see the silicon waveguide core here. The typical dimensions are about 220 nanometer. That's a standard in the foundry used today. Obviously, some people are moving to 300 nanometer. The width is about 450, so you want to design this to propagate just a single mode, so this is a single mode waveguide. Typically, you fabricate this using E-beam lithography. You want to large-scale fabrication, you can go to these uh, DBUV uh, steppers, where you can get many of these chips at the same time, but by, by this, uh, this is much more expensive, obviously. Uh, use uh, 200 millimeter or 300 millimeter silicon wafers, and what is a very good uh, news for people working optics, you don't need to grow these layers, right? This has been developed again by silicon microelectronics. These wafers are called silicon on isolator because the silicon is sitting here on the isolating silicon dioxide layer, which is here sitting on the silicon wafer, right? But this is just for the handling purpose, but really for optical uh, functionality, this is what, what counts, what is important. And this was developed for uh, CMOS electronics. So you can really buy these things relatively cheaply in the perfect quality, right? Or nearly perfect quality, microelectronics. And as I said, bend reduce uh, two microns. So this is how the optical mode would look like approximately, so you can really see it's very nicely confined here, right? <laughs> and then you can make certain uh, structures like this. This is a ring resonators, actually, with a spiral waveguide there. With a, we are using this five micron band radius to, 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 to turn the Archimedes spiral backwards, right? And I will talk about this in an application uh, of these uh, devices for biological sensing later on. So what is Mother Nature giving us a silicon? So is it really? Uh, uh, why it should be working for optics if it's working for photonics? Well, because we are really very lucky. If you think the transparency range of silicon is from 1.1 micron approximately up to 8 microns. Here it is strongly absorbing, like invisible, you cannot be using it because there is um, indirect bang up. So uh, everything would be absorbed here and also here. But you have this big window from 1.1, 1.2 micron to about uh, actually to about eight micrometers, so that's very nice. All the, these telecom wavelengths can be used there. 
and the refractive index is very high, 3.5 at 1550. This is what is allowing to really the high integration density. That's the key. That's great for propagation. What about for uh, modulators, for lasers, for detectors? Well, we are not that lucky there. Diamond uh, cubic crystallic structure, that's silicon, and uh, it's centrosymmetric, so we don't have Pockel's effect. We don't have linear electrode effects, like in light to narrow bait, for example. So high speed really modulators are mm, difficult to make, right? And even more difficult is to make a laser, because unlike in the force fiber, the minimum conduction band is perfectly aligned in momentum space with the minimum valence band. Here you have a momentum mismatch, so you have an indirect recombination, so for every electron which is exciting here, uh, to recombine radiatively to generate photon, the probability is just one over million, right? So for one emitted photon, I lost another million into the heat, basically, generation. So make a laser silicon, it's a big, big, big problem. Typically, people are using this kind of modulator, so it's uh, PN junction. Yeah, so you inject the carriers, you change the number of electrons or holes, that changes the refractive in the absorption and through Kramer's chronic radiation refractive index. And uh, obviously you need to put some electricity there and, and the signal, um, high speed, right? So you need a traveling wave electrode. But you can see today we can be uh, getting modulation of the speed of 40 gigabit per second, which was unthinkable 10 years ago. We were talking about mega, mega, uh, mega, mega bit per second, right? The insertion loss typically about 6 dB, extinction ratio about 8 dB. So that's state of the art, state of the art. How we do photodetectors, people are usually putting germanium on the top. Germanium uh, has a strong absorption at 1.5 microns, so there is a lot of uh, different uh, structure you can uh, uh, think about, right? And uh, these are, these structures are included in the commercial products today. Uh, the bandwidths are uh, higher than 40 gigahertz, uh, low dark currents, less uh, than uh, microamps, uh, substantial less these days, and really uh, responsivity close to theoretical limit, one amp per watt. What about laser? Well, it's, uh, it's a big struggle, right, to make uh, silicon to lace, maybe it's not gonna happen anytime soon. So uh, what people mostly do, so why we don't use for laser something that we know how to make it very well, for example, 3.5 indium phosphide, and then just uh, uh, integrate it with silicon. Uh, and this is an example uh, of uh, structure developed by the University of California, Santa Barbara, by John, John Bowers group in collaboration with Intel, where you have the silicon waveguide here, and then put on the top indium phosphide laser, you know, 3.5 uh, structure, so the mode bas basically overlaps uh, Evanescent field here interacts with that uh, uh, um, amplifier, like active medium, right? And this is how you can get it laced. Uh, this is based off, uh, on, uh, uh, th this is the fundamental building block of this uh, uh, integrated transmitter chip from Intel that is uh, using data centers these days where you put these uh, four different lasers, each at the different wavelengths, the similar as I show you the, the structure, right? And then you, each laser is independently modulated by 12.5 gigabit per second per channel. Then you use a multiplexer to bring all these four wavelengths together and send it through one fiber so you can have aggregated uh, capacity 500 gig gigabit per second in one optical fiber. And this uh, is just the very first product, 2011. Today, they have actually uh, uh, better performing uh, cables uh, than this. This was a uh, uh, big achievement when it actually happened a few years ago. And then you have an entire ring if you add the receiver there where you just do the contrary, right? So you do reverse, you multiplex, and you detect each wavelength separately. So uh, can we bring this even closer to the chip, and we have heard uh, comments that uh, from uh, Peter Winsor, I recall it, FIFO would be a really great fiber in, fiber out from the chip, because uh, uh, electricity is not that good for really transmitting information at the speeds we are actually reaching today, so if we can use light, it would be much more comfortable. This is, uh, has been recently published in Nature. Uh, you can see this is a, a single chip microprocessor that communicates directly using light. You have a chip processor mode, 
and chip memory mode, and these two parts of the chips are actually communicating through this via optical fiber. You have a receiver on one side uh, and transmitter. So basically, it's exactly what you do in the data center, but now you are bringing it directly on the chip. So this is actually first example of really integration of optoelectronics on the chip uh, of this uh, kind of scale, right? You have 70 million transistor, 850 photons components that work together to provide logic, memory, and uh, optical interconnects. You look at it, it's pretty impressive, right? You have the processor, uh, memory, right? And these uh, communication banks, basically transceivers. Uh, I'm mostly obviously interested in this optical part. You can see we have bait guides, tapers, diffraction gratings. I will show you some example how to do these things later on. Uh, silicon germanium for detectors, again, taper. And uh, modulator, it's usually uh, using the ring configuration, right? So uh, it looks really great. Uh, looks uh, like sky is the limit. So where is the catch? Where is the problem? Well, the uh, major problem in silicon is just uh, we just have silicon and silicon dioxide and silicon photonics and very few other materials. This is not like in 3.5 semiconductors in the phosphide gallium arsenide where you can change the composition, different ternary, quaternary composition. You can change the band gap. You can change the uh, uh, refractive index, uh, lattice constant, all these things. No, he, he just basically are really uh, constrained and stuck with two materials. So if I just ask you, can you uh, put some material there? Can, can you create the index of 2.2, not 3.5? Well, yeah, if I bring some other material of that index, but in the CMOS foundry, they will tell you, no, this is not compatible with the CMOS process. So you're actually not allowed to be bringing additional material to the process. You have to play what is there, right? You cannot be bringing your own materials that would contaminate the chambers and the, the fabrication process, right? So you have to really stick to the process. So there is no uh, easy solution to that. Uh, you can be using kind of maybe uh, get a little bit extra freedom using multi-level etching levels, right? But uh, that's uh, not easy either and doesn't have a big dynamic range. So the only question is, can the silicon design space be expanded without losing the advantage and simplicity of silicon? Well, what can we do? Can we think about some kind of meta material based on silicon with a different refractive index, for example? And this is really inspirational uh, paper. Uh, to my view, I, I don't see this paper quoted uh, often in metamaterial literature, but this is really the first time, in my view, that metamaterial was actually created. Henry Hertz, he was working with his newly discovered radio waves. Uh, at the time, it was like six meter long waves. And he actually discovered when he put this uh, metallic grid like that, right? And then sent through that grid a polarization which was parallel to the grid, electric field oscillating parallel to the grid. This grid behaves as a complete opaque screen and basically reflect a reflector. It was a perfectly metallic. When he switched the polarization, right, you can see he's driving here now vertical, but when you switch this plus and minus here horizontal, all of a sudden, sudden this, uh, so now you are entering this polarization perpendicular to the grid and it's becoming transparent like dielectric. So just by switching a polarization, this is uh, behaving very differently. For one polarization, it's behaving as a metal. For another polarization, it's behaving as a dielectric. So, Arguably, this will be the first meta material created by uh, consciously by men, that is, as far as I understand. We can ask Professor John Pendry if uh, we'll certainly ask him. So, again, we want to avoid metals, right, in uh, silicon photonics because metal would introduce some loss. So, we would like to be all dielectric. So, can we do something like that but using silicon only? So, just the thing about Simple diffraction grading, you have, I am sure each of you have seen that in the undergrad physics, right? So I shine light, a very simple perpendicular to that, right? So then you have this grating equation that is basically telling you that uh, sine of the uh, angle in reflection or transmission simply is determined by this uh, ratio of wavelength divided by the grading periodicity, grading pitch, and this is the diffraction order. So by adjusting or changing this value here, obviously I can control the angle of different orders, but also the number of different orders which are allowed. So what happens if I just increase this factor here, 
if I basically increase, okay, if I decrease the pitch, right, would be increasing this factor. So it comes to the point when period is shorter than the wavelength, then this factor became larger than one and sinus of the angle is larger than one. It cannot be fulfilled in the real numbers, right? Uh, then all the diffraction orders are suppressed. You just have direct transmittance and a kind of final reflection from this. So uh, this layer, then I can say, well, will behave not really as a, I can for, forget about the structuring, right? And will be kind of uh, behaving as a homogeneous and anisotropic level with the average dielectric permittivity or index of refraction. What is going to be that permittivity? What is going to be the index of refraction? Depends on the polarization, very much like in the Hertz experiment when he found that different polarization different, uh, behave very differently here too. And again, we don't need to uh, uh, read recent papers, uh, whether people just go 1956 in the Soviet physics journal, right? Uh, Sergei Rito got this nice, really powerful homogenization theory. Say, okay, for the light which is polarized per parallel to these, to these planes, you know, to these slabs, the averaging is like this, and for the light which is perpendicular, the averaging is like this, kind of reciprocal, right? one over index. Okay, and this is simply the duty ratio, which is the amount of silicon, let's say, compared to the pitch, right? So, so you can control now the index of this material by changing the duty cycle, by changing the, uh, the volume fraction of silicon in that, in that material. Well, this is uh, great, uh, we invented something great, but night nature actually knew it uh, millions of years before us. If you actually look at this uh, moth, nine, nine flying butterfly moth. So if you look at the eye, the eye has this triangular pyramids here, which basically, this is a sub-wavelength scale, so there is no diffraction when the light is passing from here to the eye, to, to cornea, right? And uh, you gradually adjust the refractive index. This is a graded index structure so that you effectively suppress reflection. And this helps the species to survive because when it flies during night and, and the reflection of the moon would be seen in the eyes by the predator, the moth would be eaten by some bad species that is, so this is actually, uh, so that's why these structures sometimes are also called the moth eye structures, right? So there are two generic uh, geometries you can think about sub of these sub structures. One is perpendicular propagation to the grating plane. So I have a grating and I just come perpendicular to it. So I pass once, right, through this, through this structure. And well, there is a lot of hype now about metasurfaces. There were paper in science by Harvard, by Professor Capasso, you know, in, in nature. A lot of uh, big hype, right? But uh, really the first structure like that was uh, created by uh, Philippe Lalanne and uh, Pierre Chavel uh, in France, uh, 1990s. Uh, they call it, they didn't call it meta surface, they call it binary uh, blazed gratings, so you can see this is the grating period, and there is a sub wavelength grating uh, imprinted on, on that single period, but you are basically changing the, uh, the, the effective index, right, of your, of your grating layer within a single period, right? So this is effectively emulating something like that, yeah? So it's the index profile, which is a little bit inclined, exactly as in a shell grating, a shell light. And these actually flow in Gaia satellites, uh, I think, 15 years ago. Uh, and uh, it's all based on titanium dioxide uh, nanopillars, very much like these structures now from Harvard, that uh, they put some uh, chirp uh, of the uh, pitch to get some lensing effect. Obviously, you can be controlling uh, uh, complex uh, um, transmittance of the beam through these structures. You can control amplitude in general, right, polarization. You can, uh, you can uh, control beam uh, very precisely. So this is a lot of, right, if you look at the uh, number of papers in met metamaterial, uh, me uh, metasurfaces, is, uh, is just amazing, right? Uh, so this was about 2000, what, 2016, 2015, maybe 2013, right? Uh, in 2006, we thought, okay, so we came to it from the different angle, right? We were working the waveguides and asked a little bit crazy question at the time, can we propagate light 
in a waveguide like that. So now I'm not propagating perpendicular to this subalignment structure, but I'm pro pro uh, propagating like that. Well, if this is silicon and this is silicon dioxide, index of silicon 3.5, silicon dioxide, so what would be, if we just put it in free space, piece of silicon and piece of silicon dioxide, what would be a reflectivity, final reflectivity between silicon and silicon dioxide? What, what is reflectivity between glass and air? 4%, right? So here we would have 30%. So you think how many interfaces I have here for one centimeter propagation, about 30,000. So 30,000 each surface is gonna be reflecting 30%. This is not, the light is not gonna get far away, right? Well, uh, it was not already the case, and we showed that we can have really perfectly ideal low slice propagation of the waveguide. And uh, so how is this possible, right? If you think about the waveguide uh, structure like that, so I have these red, uh, 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 blocks, uh, let's say silicon, high index material surrounded by blue, low index material, let's say silicon dioxide. This is the pitch, this is duty uh, this is the amount of silicon right here. And uh, so you have basically three regions, okay? Generally speaking. First is the Bragg reflection. So if the pitch here, like the lambda, is approximately half of the wavelength of light in this waveguide, well, I have a Bragg effect or you can call it photonic bang up, photon crystal effect, right? Uh, we have uh, Professor Yablonovich here who is one of the father of, of the concept, right? And, uh, and the light uh, propagating here would not propagate too far because you really have these reflections uh, at, each, uh, at each segment. And uh, after a few blocks, basically the light would just get reflected back and constructively interfere in the backward direction. So, you will have a BRAC grading, basically, which are using optical fiber, right, for sensing, et cetera, et cetera, you know that. So then, if I stretch the grading more, uh, make this pitch longer than the wavelength, or half the wavelength, then I would have a simple diffraction grading, and the light would be radiated out of the waveguide plane, uh, up and down, and this effect we'll be using for surface grading, I'll probably be showing you later on. But if we now go to this, pitch where this is gonna be shorter than half of the wavelength, all of a sudden this start beha be, uh, behaving as a homogeneous material. The light would be propagating losslessly through this. And what is really nice here, by changing the ratio between of A to lambda, we can, by controlling the amount of silicon material compared to silicon dioxide, well, I can have a different index. If I put, if I put more of red, more of, more of silicon and less of silicon dioxide, the index will be closer to silicon, et cetera. So now I can really have a waveguide with refractive index, material with refractive index anywhere between silicon and silicon dioxide, right? And on the top, I can control even dispersion. I can control biofringes, not only index, and again, you can uh, recur to this very basic equation by Ritov that you can get some higher order correction terms if you can be, want to be more precise, but they are actually working very nice. But uh, how is it possible this works, right? Because uh, that's uh, what is really the fundamental uh, theory behind that. Well, this is exactly the same situation people were asking 70 years ago, how come the electrons can propagate in metals if uh, there are so many atoms and those electrons are gonna be scattering like crazy, right? So that was a big question in solid state physics. What is the propagation of electrons? What is the theory behind you know, metals? Until Felix Bloch came with a very elegant solution. So well, the electron can propagate perfectly losslessly in this dense uh, packing of atoms, right? Uh, in, in the lattice, if we assume that their wave function uh, is, periodic, is, is periodical with the same periodicity as the crystal. So you can actually think that these electrons are basically adopting the wave function which has the same periodicity as the environment and then they go, go basically uh, in between these atoms without any loss. So that's exactly what's happening here. You can rethink about your waveguide mode as a plane wave which is simply modulated, right? The plane wave which is modulated by the periodic function which equals the periodicity, with the periodicity equal of the, of the structure, right? So that's uh, one key message to, to remember. Another one here, 
again, fundamental message. And now we can control the metamaterial, we can call it metamaterial refractive index of the waveguide core simply by mixing the two dielectric material, silicon, silicon dioxide, and, uh, by varying the geometry of the grading. Okay, so it's a nice uh, theoretical concept and something cool. We nearly got it in nature. Uh, just one referee was not happy about that. And very high level experts say, I don't believe in this. Well, we, and it was rejected and then we ended up in optics letters. Uh, so can we do something uh, useful out of this? Think about the problem, how to couple light and for every uh, really presentation we have heard today on uh, which in, in includes integrated optics the question is how you really couple light into these chips this is a critical this is a critical parameter right if you look uh, and uh, people recognize this this is a really a problem from the very early days of integrated optics but with silicon photonics this goes even worse because as I say the mode in silicon waveguide is so small right it's 500, 600 times smaller in area than mode in SMA28 fiber. So if I just bring SMA28, which is about 10 micron mode flow diameter, want to couple it here, well, there is a mode mismatch about 500 times, 600 times. So what is the percentage of the power that is going to get there? Well, I would say 0.5% and 99.5% is going to get lost. Well, and we did this and uh, we showed that this can be done actually uh, uh, very efficiently, the coupling. So you can see I'm transforming the silicon waveguide into now a waveguide with a meta material index which is very similar to the of the fiber, right? So now I should have a perfect mode matching at the edge between uh, the facet facing the fiber close to the chip. So when I send my light, light simply expands, right? And you have a nice mode matching. So how good this works? Well, it looks nearly perfect. This is actually the highest efficiency coupler, uh, really state of the art. We have 0.32 dB loss per facet. You know, usually you are getting 10 dB, right? In this thing of 5 dB. PDL, polarization dependent loss is less than 0.05 dB. So this is nearly polarization independent. And that's thanks to, don't want to get ETA's really ability to engineer the index for two polarizations independently. And we did this work with uh, Traxio now. It was, uh, it's part of Siena in Quebec City. Uh, well, IBM looked at the idea and a few years ago, I uh, went to plenary talk of uh, Yuri Vlasov at Photonics uh, uh, West and they were presenting this as their coupling solution for the advanced packaging process. And they have been working on that quite uh, quite intensely, they're really happy uh, with, the, with the copper. So you can see it's really very, the same concept. And now they are facing it directly to SMF28 fiber, which is a little bit bigger issue because we were coupling to a kind of a little bit smaller mode size. We we're using lens fiber, but you know, those details are just technicalities. I don't want to be boring you with, right? More recently, I saw a few presentations from IBM. Uh, they say, well, not just this is helping us to couple light the chip, but also this is an interesting property that the backscatter is actually 30 dB smaller in these waveguides than uh, silicon wire waveguides. And uh, that's something people say, well, this doesn't make any sense because you're introducing this additional uh, interruption, the additional boundaries, this has to be scattering like crazy. And this was actually one of the primary <laughs> reasons I thought we should investigate that. Like, over 10, 10 years ago, because I, I felt that right, if we lower the index of the, of, of, of the core, we increase the mode size, the sensitivity to imperfections in the, on the side walls, right, say, if you're coming out of, after the etching of the waveguide, et cetera, the processing should be actually reduced. And this is actually true, right? So, so it's a big advantage for them, obviously, particularly when you are coupling these things to a laser, any back reflection or back scatter can, uh, uh, really negatively impact your laser performance to have this 30 dB uh, advantage there. So that's one way we can couple light to, to the chip, yeah, through the edge. Obviously, there is another way we can be coupling, coming from the top, bringing the fiber like that, nearly vertical, and there is a resonance grading, right? And you know, this has been known for 40, 40 years, integrated optics, doing the things like that, right? then you can really very easily align. You can use just cleave SMF-28 fiber, right? 
10 micron node size, so the alignment tolerance, a couple of micron is not gonna do any uh, serious damage to you, right? You don't need to cleave uh, different, separate different dyes before you test, right? You don't need to prepare the facets, you just bring your fiber here and there, so you can do really wafer level testing before you are gonna be uh, laboriously uh, separating different dyes, so you're, if the wafer doesn't work, you don't need to go through all these extra uh, expensive processes. And then you can really use this wafer level testing uh, where you bring your fiber very much like you would bring your electric probe, right, in your RF, measurements fiber in, fiber out, and you can very quickly evaluate how the wafer uh, fabrication went and how the devices work, right? A little bit, a uh, couple of basics, right? So in silicon, this is, uh, as I said, typically 220 nanometer silicon. Thickness, uh, if you just make rating like that, obviously at the beginning, all of a sudden you have a strong grading, and then as you are going further, right, the, the field is gonna be diffracted, but the near field is gonna be near exponential, right? So at the beginning, you just have a very strong diffraction, right? And then as less and less light is remaining in the waveguide, you are gonna be tapering it out, so you have this exponential tail. So, you know, really, you would like to have a Gaussian near field so that you can couple to the Gaussian or near Gaussian mode of the SMF28 fiber. And if you don't do this, the, what is the mode overlap of the exponential, the best case scenario of the Gaussian is about 80%, right? But that's not good enough. I would like to have 95% uh, if possible. And uh, this is the idea we worked with uh, Robert Harry at that time, uh, our PhD student, and he visited us in, uh, in, uh, from the University of Malaga, now he's a professor in Malaga. And uh, a lot of things now I'm gonna be showing it was done in collaboration with the University of Malaga and it was really our pleasure working with that group and uh, I can state without their uh, substantial contribution, uh, my presentation today would be very different and much poorer. So I'm very blessed to work with that fantastic group, you know, and I think these are some of the best designers, of photonics, integrated optics designers group in the world. So uh, what we actually did, we have this diffraction grading here, usually, but we superpose perpendicular diffraction grading as sub wavelength grading, and uh, with a different uh, duty cycle here. So you can see the equivalent grading to this would be, well, when I have these just little openings, right? It would be mostly silicon everywhere, right? But when I'm getting bigger openings, it can be silicon dioxide, fill, or air, then I have just a stronger grading, right? So obviously, I need exactly that. At the beginning, I need a weak grading, right? To cut this exponential edge, right? And make it like near Gaussian. So you really can, if you do this, right? This will be the uniform grading. You can see the Gaussian fiber or near Gaussian fiber mode, yeah? And that the uniform, this is near field from the grading, ex near exponential, right? And here when you do the apodization, you get the uh, mode matching 95% or more. So that is exactly what we did. Uh, we're going to let it be more. This was some of the hero experiments uh, at that time. I still, it's uh, the highest efficiency at standard 220 nanometer thick SOI. You can see the Luxterra is using 300 nanometer SOI. The main argument for getting to 300 nanometer thick layer was because it is very difficult to make high, high efficiency couplers in 220 nanometer SOI, right? So you need to really have a high efficiency coupling. They need, that was the main reason they went to 300, 300 nanometer or 310 nanometer. And uh, so what we actually, this is the uh, grading as I just explained. And obviously when you come from the waveguide, then part of the light is diffracting up and part of the light is diffracting down. Unfortunately, right, not everything is going up because this grading in principle is symmetric and uh, vertical direction. So then what we did, we basically put, uh, use some backside processing, remove the underneath silicon wafer, deposit aluminum mirror, and then combine these two things. Obviously, you have to combine them in phase so that there is a constructive interference to, you to calculate about all this uh, optical path between this and this has to be modulo two pi, right? Optical phase. And we got 0.7 dB uh, experimental, as I say. So, it worked very, very nice. Now the question is, uh, obviously you would like to uh, avoid that uh, backside processing, the etching uh, silicon underneath and uh, depositing aluminum. Can we have this like a, really that all the light is gonna be going up where the fiber is, right? 
Well, uh, why we don't use the blazing effect? It's very similar to that uh, Philip Lalan uh, meta uh, material greeting I show you, right? Uh, uh, having kind of triangular, triangular tools, right? The greeting, greeting tools, right? So if you do really this and you play with this, for example, structure like that, you know, uh, most of the light by is actually constructively interfering up and be, because you have some, uh, some interference between the light uh, scattered by this uh, uh, deep trench or by this part of the, of the tools and this part of the tools, right? And, and when these two, when you design it properly, these two interferences can actually cancel interferometrically when you go down, right? and everything would be going up. And if we really think about it, if you just zoom and think conceptually how this would look, so you have this one grating tooth, right? If we just think, okay, these are two scatters, right? And uh, if you design it such that conceptually there is going to be separated in horizontally and vertically by lambda quarter, then the light coming here, the wavefront, like coming here, you know, you can see what is the phase difference between this path and this path. No, no, because I have lambda quarter extra here, but then I have lambda quarter extra here, so they remain in phase. But what's the phase difference between, uh, between this and between this? Well, here it goes direct. And here it goes lambda quarter and extra lambda quarter. So there is phase difference, uh, the, the, the optical part different lambda half, then you will have destructive interference. So it's a nice way of thinking about these things a little bit from, from the fundamental, from the fundamental point, of, right? So we made this and uh, got about 1.3 dB coupling efficiency, uh, again, experimentally. And uh, now, uh, at that time, my PhD student, Daniel Benedikovic, is now with uh, Silicon Photonic Group at um, Paris, uh, CNRS, uh, with uh, Professor Laurent Vivian. And uh, they work together with ST uh, Microelectronics uh, and are getting these gratings for deep UV uh, lithography, right? Because all this was made by uh, EB. Okay, so uh, a while ago, I met uh, Professor uh, at uh, uh, University of uh, Ghent. And uh, so, Paul, would be really a million dollar question is how you can make these grading couplers ultra broadband, right? Because now, one dB bandwidth of these couplers, about 30, 40 nanometers, that's not enough for WDM. You need different channels, right? In the different wavelengths, you need the bandwidth of uh, hopefully 100 nanometers, not 30. So, we have been thinking for maybe five years about that. And we said, well, look, this is what is really limiting my, uh, my efficiency, eh? my, uh, my, <laughs> my bandwidth on my coupler. Well, I'm, if I'm changing the wavelength, the angle emitted by the grading coupler is basically changing because this is a great diffraction grading and this is again, this is just everything a little bit different with this, the same grading equation I showed you a few slides ago. So the angle is basically arcus sinus of this, right? But uh, what is really changing with wavelength is the wavelength, right? So can I kill this factor? Well, yeah, if I can kill this factor by putting M diffraction order equal to zero, one, then I would just have this constant factor here. It's not going to be changing with wavelength. And yeah, this is going to be slightly changing the wavelength because of the material dispersion and the wave dispersion of these refractive indices. And you still can take a like, derivative of this uh, as a function of wavelength to make it zero and try to stabilize even that effect and find that you can actually, by playing, by, if you can synthesize the these two indices even to compensate for dispersion, then you really can have a very, very significant effect on your broadening of your spectrum, spectral performance. So conceptually, it looks like this. So this is a wire waveguide. It's transformed into sub wavelength waveguide, very much as what we do in our edge coupler, right? And then you put a prism on the top. There's a little bit price to pay for. It's not just a simple, right? So we need this extra prism step. It's a high index silicon prism. This is an AR coating here. The fiber coming here, SMF28. You can see FDTD simulation. Everything is nicely going up. And uh, uh, you see the bandwidth now is uh, 100, around 130 nanometers. And the efficiency is uh, 0 0.41. So this is DB. So this is the world record in uh, in uh, at least design efficiency. We are now working on the measurements. We fabricated recently these papers. I'm very curious to see how, how, how this works. So I will go a little bit more into how many more? OK. 
current transceivers. Uh, we have heard about it a lot. So just to remind you, a key, point, key, uh, key element there is the MMI. This is this hybrid, right? 4x4 hybrid. It's usually done by multi-mode interference coupler. Can you make this broadband, right? So again, this is really smart idea from Robert Hallier from Indus Malaga. When you think, OK, this is MMI. Yeah. How can we make, make it broadband? Well, so what is the fundamental effect here? L pi, which is the bead length, right? Uh, is uh, proportional to these numbers. So if you actually do the number, this is the cladding, the, the core index, and this is the wavelength. So as I'm changing the wavelength, the bead length is actually, uh, if you increase the wavelength, it's shortening. So my uh, device is changing the focal point, right? So my Talbot effect, uh, which is actually working here, is not going to work sharply anymore, etc. Right? So can I, the point is, can I change this n? So it varies proportionally with lambda, right? And then I can factor these two factors out, and I can stabilize it with respect to the wavelength. And actually, if you do this, believe me or not, you can do that. And uh, then we looked, we have very similar to this Ritov formula. Again, it's one, the light is propagating along z direction. So that light is actually paralyzed, paral polarized parallel to these grooves, right? And those components that are propagated across these propagating along this direction, right, are polarized perpendicular to these grooves, right? So there is this uh, metamaterial effect, which is different for different polarization, very much like in a uh, Hertz experiment. And you can approximate this uniaxial crystal. If you now modify this formula, you can see you have this extra factor two, and you substantially improve. This is a conventional MI, bead length, and this is as a functional wavelength over 400 nanometer bandwidth and compared to our anisotropic. Okay, this is the experimental results. Show 300 nanometer bandwidth. So arguably, this is some of the broadest integrated optics device ever made. What else can we do? Circumferential for sensing, right? So, can we? So far, everything was 1.5 microns, 1.3 micron wave. Can we extend the working range? What? We cannot go under 1.1 microns, shorter than that, because this bang up effect, the light will be absorbed. But can we go further? Well, the uh, transparency of silicon is up to eight microns, so we can go there. Unfortunately, what is limiting us here in silicon insulator is silicon dioxide, which is strongly absorptive at about 3.5 microns. So uh, I will show you how we can overcome that. And then we can go really to this mid infrared regime where there you have a lot of uh, uh, fingerprint uh, uh, options to use these uh, different fingerprints of different molecules, right? And you can use it for chemical sensitive with uh, high sensitivity selectivity, right? So how we can expand the range uh, to eight microns? So the idea here is to remove the silicon dioxide. This is the buried oxide. This is the under cladding, which is holding the waveguide. So what we actually do here, we open this. This is the waveguide core. We open these little holes, but those holes are actually sub wavelengthly spaced. So this is actually creating the effective index here, which is smaller than core. So we're actually providing the lateral confinement, but also through this hole, through using the hydrofluoric acid, we can etch away the silicon dioxide underneath, underneath, and those PRs are actually holding the membrane. So you're actually converting this into membrane kind of waveguide, which is pure silicon. So the light doesn't see silicon dioxide anymore. So we did this in collaboration with Southampton University. And uh, uh, Professor Goran Masanovic group, and uh, is actually principal investigator here leading this project. I'm more a collaborator here. Uh, and uh, they're getting impressive uh, losses, 0.82 dB per centimeter, 3.8 micron. And recently, they even show the extension up to 7.5 micron. So this is quite uh, promising things to, to keep your eye on. And we even fabricated some, uh, made some uh, Fourier transfer spectrometer chips based on that. Uh, NASA actually took the concept of this Fourier transform chip. I don't have time to talk about it too much. And they call it the revolutionary technology. Again, we invented this 10 years ago at the NRC Canada. And we are also working with Honeywell to make these Fourier transform spectrometers in a visible region. Obviously, so extending towards the visible region, 500 nanometer wavelength here. Then we have to abandon silicon. We have to go to something which is really transparent in that wavelength, which is silicon nitride, for example. But you can see these are pretty. Uh, so if I have five minutes more, I will show you this uh, biosensing platform we developed uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, so it's a silicon waveguide, right? You functionalize with this uh, antibody. And then when the antigen 
comes, okay, this can be, right, uh, antibody and the bacteria, for example, the viruses, right, then there is a change of refractive index in the proximity of waveguide and light is actually filling it a little bit so you have an extra phase difference depending on the length of the waveguide, right? And what we actually discovered 2006 that silicon is perfect material for doing that because if you work in TM polarization, then just ba basic Maxwell equation, the continuity for this polarization electric field, there is a continuity of D electric displacement across the boundary, that means uh, electric field is actually stronger here out of the waveguide core than in the waveguide core. So this is a cross-section of the field. So you can see exactly where you're sensing when your thing is sitting down here, where your sensing is happening, you have a very strong field. And this field discontinuity actually increased with the index of the material and silicon is the highest. Uh, maybe germanium would be higher, but we don't have germanium <laughs> insulator, right? So really, really the development. This is the spiral that we are using as a sensing element that I showed you uh, already before. So this is a ring resonator, and obviously this is a circular spot about 100 microns, so it, it's compatible with these uh, uh, spotters, which are the robots uh, they are using biotech industry. They have to put the different antibodies right on, on the little plate, so it, it can be all automatically deposited on these little spirals here, right? And uh, it's just a fluorescent label to show that we are aligning it well. Another thing you can do to increase the sensitivity, you can use again sub wavelength tricks. You can all, you can you can use a sub wavelength waveguide. You open these gaps in the waveguide, and you can fill that with your analyte. So your sensitivity is supposed to increase, right? Because you have a better overlap with your field, even better than the TM case I showed you, right? And people are. This was actually idea uh, invented by Gonzalo Wanguera Perez from uh, University of Malaga when he visited NRC a few years ago. And uh, several groups are following this. This is from uh, user BC, Lukasz Krostowski. He fabricated the first uh, biosensor based on this uh, uh, effect. And you can see these are some impressive rings, you know, these, uh, they call it multi-box waveguides to increase the effect. So these are nominal 128 sensor array chip. You can see we, are, we have these 128 different sensing elements here. There is an input grating couple sub wavelength to couple it here, and then you basically broadcast it to all different 128 uh, spirals. And then at the end, you actually couple it out uh, from the waveguide, 128 beams by using vertical grating couplers against sub wavelength engineers. And you can see with the near infrared camera just how these different spots are fingering as the biological reaction is going on, right? And then obviously you need to bring your fluid there. So there is microfluidics on chip integrated using SU8, right? Just a schematic chip like that. Optics, bring the light in, out, microfluidics. Uh, just lead experiment, E. coli, it's really dangerous bacteria, right? So this was developed because of antibiotic pressure when they are feeding stock with uh, antibiotics. Nominally, so all this crazy strain of E. coli has developed that can kill you. Obviously, E. coli is not necessarily harmful if it is a good strain we all have are in the guts, right? Uh, so, for example, 0111 is a good one, 0157 is a bad one, right? So, so you want to distinguish between the two. So you can see we have our waveguide here with some linkers, antibodies, then when the bacteria comes, right, you can see the signal. This is one I want to distinguish with respect to that. And then we still use some secondary antibody amplification step to even show really that there's a big difference between. So these are basically, by microscope, you wouldn't see any difference between these two uh, uh, coli's, but uh, the antibody knows that and will distinguish, obviously, uh, between the two, right? The biology, the mother, na mother nature works for you. And then you can see we have a different array of sensors, right, 128. I'm just showing a few of these. And you can see only this 055 element is registering the capture of this antigen of the right strain of, uh, of this bacteria. And uh, there is even more amplification when I use this antibody, secondary antibody, right? Uh, so this is my conclusion. Before that, I just want to show you a little video. I was not able to synchronize it well here. So it's going to be. So that's how it really looks. So opens, you put a chip on a holder, right? Close the system. 
then the microfluidics will, will engage now here. That's yeah, going down. Things there, and then the servo optics focusing the spots right on the radical purpose, and you measure, right? And you can measure 128 different channels uh, at the same time. Okay. So the, my main message today that uh, would be that uh, silicon photonics truly revolutionized integrated optics uh, technology and uh, we can use silicon to do things we could not really do simply in optics before. And uh, uh, why is that? Because we already have high index, uh, high index contrast, right, between silicon and silicon dioxide, right? Now we have this new ability to engineer the refractive index by metamaterial effect, right? And uh, we, it's expected that the CMOS manufacturing is, uh, will reduce the cost, hopefully, of optical components uh, in a similar fashion as uh, it uh, did a great job for us uh, uh, in microelectronics. So that uh, brings me to the end, and I would like to thank the collaborators from different institutions. As I, with a special thanks, as I say, I, I repeat again to uh, uh, this University of Malaga, and also with Maria Luisa Calvo at the University of Complutense University of Madrid. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Cheven, for this uh, very, very integrate, uh, integrated talk. Okay? So uh, everybody in the, in the room must be aware that uh, here we, not, we do not try to put a very important piece of knowledge in one specific topic. What we try to do is pills, eh, pills from, uh, with knowledge from the best expert worldwide. And this is another case, okay? So, and these technologies are, are key technologies in order to, for instance, to pass one of these uh, rules, okay, uh, with uh, a lot of equipment in order to do demonstrations in labs, uh, try to, this is key technologies in order to enable to go to the real world. So I've uh, mentioned many times in, during these days, this is a, a very, very important uh, topic uh, to do things, okay, to the real world. So now is, uh, the talk is open for, for questions. So any questions in the room? Yeah, first one. Oh, uh, I have a question regarding the subway flames grating. So what is the minimum limitation? Can you keep going smaller until uh, the DUV lithography yeah. limit you, or is there any other limitation? Yeah. So that was the objections that uh, I was facing always, right? Excellent question, right? <laughs> oh, how small this uh, has to be? Is it really fabricable? You have to be using uh, e-beam lithography, right? So. Uh, uh, my, uh, so the minimum feature size here, right? Uh, we, we always try to design uh, it with minimum feature size uh, larger than 100 nanometers, right? So let's say the width of the silicon, typically one, 150 nanometer, right? So if I can go more than 130 nanometer, that's uh, kind of comfortable for DBUV processes, right? But uh, uh, today, right, the IBM uh, coupler, right, for example, IBM uh, line that they're using is now Global Foundry, right, so it uh, was transferred to Global Foundries, right, uh, their minimum feature size is about 60 nanometer, right, so today is really no lithographic limit to do this comfortably, but even when the people were telling me this 10 years ago, oh, this is how you're going to do well, uh, I was saying, look at this roadmap. Look, look where the lithography is going. Now we are uh, using 193 nanometer yeah, lithography, but with the immersion, with the same wavelength, now people are still get, to getting to feature sizes 20, 30 nanometers, obviously, in the microelectronics uh, huge foundries, right? Which we don't have access to, like uh, photonics people, right? But the technology is there, right? So you can go, and then with uh, X rays, of the X rays, uh, lithography will be coming soon, right? So you can get the feature sizes much, much uh, actually uh, uh, smaller than you even need for 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 this. So it's uh, it's around 100 nanometer, right? So it's uh, not a big deal, right? Today, what is the size of the transistor today? 
uh, on that uh, 20, uh, chip that I showed, 20, uh, nearly 20 billion transistor. What's the size of the transistor, right? Much smaller than that, right? So we can fabricate this very well, okay? But for that, you need to go to big foundries, right? And for the, that, you need a killer ap application and convince them that they will be running uh, thousands of wafers a day for you, right? So. Okay. Sir. Yeah. yeah, because um, I mean, my very uh, probably simple-minded way of thinking about this fabrication. So you use this uh, DUV lithography, right? No, we use we use mostly E beam because uh, we have our E beam in house. So mm -hmm. we fabricate it. We don't have a e DUV stepper at NRC Canada, right? So, but we do have E beam system. So we can fabricate this within within a week, right? So I have my design, right? coming and in one week we fabricate this by e-beam lithography, right? But everything is designed such that is also compatible. We try to design with the DBUV for lithography. For example, the chips I show for, for biological sensors, right? They really needed uh, thousands of chips because we're doing many biological experiments. So those chips were actually fabricated at uh, Cialetti in France, in Grenoble, uh, and deep UV, uh, deep UV facility, right? 193 lithography. Non immersion. Thank you. We have another uh, question about the law. Um, I was thinking uh, 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 this uh, considering uh, the issues uh, that silicon has uh, with the lacking a uh, direct band gap. Um, is this a field that uh, would gain uh, much from integration with uh, two-dimensional materials that have a uh, direct band gap? Well, excellent question. Absolutely. There is a lot of people working on 2D uh, materials, right? Uh, putting sheets of graphene, uh, right, on silicon uh, for modulators, right? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's a very hot uh, research topic uh, if you are really uh, you have a good group then the probability you will publish in nature or science uh, being in this field this is really very very uh, very cool these days right uh, combining 2d material with silicon there is also you know uh, I presume you are from Italy originally, right? So Professor Lorenzo Pavesi in Trento, so he did a lot of work on trying to really make uh, silicon convinced to lace, right? Which, uh, which is still not there, but uh, you have some really uh, impressive, uh, obviously, group working on the lasers right, uh, in Italy, right? But, uh, and now another really interesting approach is uh, really growing on silicon uh, uh, three, five directly, right? So John Bowers, before he was uh, with Intel, that laser was just put the laser on the top, right? And uh, that was the way to go. But the, the last few uh, uh, plenary uh, talks I uh, attended from him, so now they are mostly really believing that the uh, way forward is to grow directly 3.5 on silicon, which is very difficult, right? For, cannot go to details, right? And uh, particularly quantum dot lasers, right? And uh, they are actually showing some really nice uh, quantum dot laser fully integrated, monolithically, right, integrated on silicon. Thank you. Any other question? We have another one in the middle of the room. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question um, is regarding the issue of detection of bacteria. Did you use uh, the same antibody for two two kind of different two kind bacteria? Uh, obviously, uh, you need a different antibody for each bacteria, right? Uh, so, also we are not using uh, entire bacteria; they are really too big. So we use. Uh, uh, lysed uh, bacteries, uh, bacteria, so which basically kill them, right? We then naturalize them. Then we uh, fragment the bacteria, so we have basically cellular wall, uh, small fragments of, fragments of bacteria. And uh, you need uh, specific, obviously, antibodies for each bacteria. So, but uh, we synthesize uh, 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 100 different antibodies. You can, uh, you can buy them, right? But we were using uh, really monoclonal, not polyclonal, monoclonal, uh, camel-based uh, antibodies with only one, uh, because uh, human-based antibodies is, is two, two, two binding sites, right? So, uh, so the, again, these are these are really details. But you have uh, your chip is basically printed by this uh, robot, right? 
uh, with uh, 128, in principle, 128 completely different antibodies, right? And then as the microfluid is flows there, just your antibody number 25 is gonna say, oh, this is E. coli strain 25, which is the killer, right? And uh, if there is a good one, uh, 77, whatever, so that, that, that specific antibody is gonna be responding and capturing and really capturing that, that bacteria there, okay? <laughs> Any other question? Okay, just to conclude, uh, I must say that I was very pleased to hear that the coupling losses are so low at this time, because uh, this is a key issue in order to, to minimize the insertion loss of the devices. I worked in this area and it was very difficult to get a very low loss Coupling, uh, coupling laws. So I'm very impressed that the, the result I saw was so very low coupling losses. So I was really impressive. So it's time to it's time to close the sec the the tour and the section of this morning. And now we have uh, free time in order to 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 have lunch or whatever you like. Uh, let's before to go. Let's thanks to all the speakers. And please remember that uh, this afternoon, 3 p.m., 3.30, as every day, we are going to start again with uh, a section uh, focused on uh, optical fiber sensor technology, okay? Uh, after, that, after that, we are going to have a family photo, okay? And just after that, we are going to have here, very close, in our room, a reception, a reception from the uh, local council with uh, drinks, tapas, and, and it's a, going to be a very nice time not only to do socialization and networking and, well, whatever you like, okay? Thank you.